Welcome to another episode of From the Luthiers Workbench. Today I'm going to be continuing with part six of the oak kitchen top table guitar build. And what that means is I'm going to show you how I did this glow in the dark inlay. And then I'm going to do some final sanding and then I'll apply some stain. So let's jump in and get started. The first step to doing the glow in the dark inlay is to paint the inside of the inlay cavities with some uh, water based white acrylic craft store paint. This will help the inlay really stand out when it's dark. As you can see, I'm kind of slopping it in here. It's not that big a deal because I'm going to be sanding the surface later on and that will take off all that extra white sloppiness. The medium that I'll be mixing the glow in the dark powder into is called ultra clear epoxy. This is basically a two part bar top or tabletop epoxy. And you mix it together in equal parts and stir in the glow powder for about five minutes to make sure that you get everything thoroughly mixed. And the glow in the dark powder I'm using is Art and Glow's uh, Strontium Illuminate. And I'll start with the red, which kind of looks pink, but it'll actually be red. After it's been thoroughly mixed for five minutes, I can just drizzle the mixture into the inlay cavities where I want it to be. This epoxy has a long working time, so you don't have to rush. And then once I've applied it, I like to take a butane lighter and just touch it across the surface, and that will pop any air bubbles that are trapped within it. And then I'll let that epoxy dry for about six hours before applying my second color. And once that six hours has passed, I can mix up another batch of the epoxy, but this time I'm gonna be using some Aqua Strontium Illuminate Glow in the Dark Powder from Art and & Glow. And I'll stir it up just like I did before, making sure that I keep stirring for at least five minutes. I have a much larger area to fill in, so I'll mix up a little bit more of the epoxy, and then I'll just start drizzling it in, just like I did the red. And I'm not really going to be too concerned about being clean and, and precise here. I'm just going to slop the stuff on, and I want to make sure that I thoroughly fill each cavity, and then maybe drizzle in a little on top of it to make sure that once I have uh, finished the inlay, and let it dry, I can sand it down so that the entire surface is smooth and level. So I want to make sure I have a little bit of extra epoxy in each of these cavities. And then uh, once I've finished applying it, before it has a chance to set up, I'm going to grab my lighter and I'll uh, heat the surface to pop any air bubbles that might be trapped in the surface. Now, in truth, for an area this large, you could probably go ahead and use a propane torch to do this. Depending on the temperature of where you're working, it's going to probably take 6 to 12 hours for it to dry. So I just let it sit overnight. Then I ran it through my drum sander to sand off the excess and then followed up by sanding with my random orbital sander and some 150 grit sandpaper. Now, if you don't have a drum sander, you can just use a coarser grit with your random orbital sander or even hand sand it if you want to. You'll get the same results. At this point, the inlay portion of this project is, is finished, so I could proceed with continuing to sand the rest of the body. However, I discovered something that I decided I wanted to change, and that is the position of the volume pot on the guitar body. It was too close to that one tail, so what I did was I taped off the back side of the hole sort of to provide a, a dam. And then I filled the hole with some uh, 
uh, pieces of, of wood dust and, and wood chips. And then I flooded it with some CA glue. And the funny thing is, is since this was an oak butcher block tabletop that was used for over 20 years, there's some dings and dents and some holes uh, in the surface of it that also needed to be fixed. So I just went ahead and filled them with CA glue and then sprinkled uh, fine sawdust over the top of it and let it dry. Then I could go back and sand it all with my random orbital sander to get everything nice and smooth. Now, of course, you can probably see these uh, appearing as I uh, finish this, but it really doesn't matter. Uh, the The hole on the front that I plugged is going to probably be covered by a knob, so it's not going to matter anyway. And, you know, this is a butcher block tabletop, so I don't think it really matters that much. After marking the position for the new tuner hole, I drilled it out with a 3 8 inch diameter brad point drill bit. And this is what the inlay looks like in the daylight, and then what it looks like when the lights are switched off. Pretty cool, huh? Hey guys, if you're enjoying this video and would like to show support for what I'm doing on my guitar building channel, but don't necessarily want to spend a lot of your own hard-earned money, all you got to do is click that thumbs up button down there, and that's going to tell YouTube I'm doing the right thing and keeping my audience happy. And as a result, they'll recommend my videos more often. So click that thumbs up button. Thanks. And now I was off to the oscillating spindle sander where I sanded down the sides of this guitar body to make everything as smooth as possible. I've had some questions from viewers about the thickness of this guitar body, which I think is kind of weird. No one's ever asked me about the thickness of my guitar bodies before. But I think it's because this guitar appears to be a bit thicker than you might expect. You know, after all, a Stratocaster is one and three quarter inches thick. This guitar is 1.9 inches thick, and that actually puts it right between the thickness of a Stratocaster and a thicker Les Paul, which is usually about 2.1 inches thick. So I'm not sure why people are so concerned about that, but yeah, it is the internet. After I'd finished sanding the sides, it was time to drill the hole for the output jack. And to do that, I like to start by drilling a 7 8 inch diameter hole with a Forstner bit, but I'll stop just after I begin it. And then I'll switch to a half inch diameter brad point bit to drill out the majority of the wood. Then I'll switch back to that 7 8 inch bit and finish it. It just goes a lot faster this way. Now it was time to move on to the finished sanding. And I'll do this by sanding the surface with a block wrapped in uh, 100 grit sandpaper. And then I'll constantly check my progress because what I'm looking for are tool marks and any inconsistent surfaces. I also like to use other tools such as um, a rubber uh, sanding block. And this is actually a cheap dollar store large uh, eraser. They work great for this. When I cut this body on the CNC machine, I wasn't really sure how I wanted to finish the edges, so I just left them sharp. And then I decided to go back in and form a beveled edge. And I'm just going to form that by using some coarse sandpaper wrapped around either a uh, rubber eraser or a wooden sanding block to get a nice smooth bevel. I also decided to use uh, a Japanese Iwasaka file to form a little bit of a scalloped contour to the cutaway. And then I decided to use that same approach to carve a little bit more of an aggressive bevel where the neck will meet the body. Even though those Japanese Iwasaka files do a great job of removing wood, I have to go back in and sand from about a uh, 100 grit up to 150 grit to get it smooth. And here you can see I'm using one of the drums from my oscillating spindle sander to wrap the sandpaper around so I can get into that uh, scallop around the uh, lower horn. And the key is to get that bevel nice and consistent all the way around the body. And then I dropped the control cavity cover into the body and sanded it at the same time to get everything uh, nice and consistent uh, as far as the thickness is concerned. 
Before I move on to finish sanding uh, with my 220 grit, I like to raise the grain and I'll do that by wiping the surface down with a cloth that's been dampened with water and then I'll let it dry. This will cause the fine wood grain fibers on the surface to curl up and you can actually feel how rough it is. Then when I hit it with the 220 grit sandpaper, it's going to remove those uh, wood fibers and make the surface extra smooth. When I sand all these surfaces, I try to move the sandpaper in the direction of the grain, or at least in the same direction. And after finishing with the 220 grit, I was ready to apply the stain. And for this project, I'm using the same stain that I used on the neck. It's just a Verathane Golden Oaks uh, oil-based stain. Once I had finished applying the stain, I hung it up to dry, and I'll leave it here probably for a couple of days, and then I'll uh, revisit it and see if I need to add another coat, because oftentimes that first coat will soak in so deep that a second coat might be necessary to really make it look nice. Well, guys, that's all the time I've got for this episode. In episode seven, I've got a decision to make about how I want to proceed with this build. So in the meantime, take care, stay safe, give me that thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, and I'll see you soon.